Kidding. Okay. Uh, welcome, one and all, to the Charles Wood Historical Society welcomes you to the first lecture in our Heritage Lecture Series for the year 2015 and 16. And uh, we have our historical families of Charles Wood, two of them presenting tonight, the Chapman and the Vilus. And it's going to be a really, really interesting presentation. So good to see so many of you. But before uh, we begin our first presentation, uh, Dan Furlan, who's vice president of the Charles of Historical, has an announcement to make re another old historical Charles with family. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. I've been allotted one minute to let you know that at Heron House, this weekend at 11 o'clock, we're unveiling two historic plaques, one for Heron House, for both the Herons and the Fresh families lived over time, and also for the St. Charles Ferry. So, copies of those signs are at the back table, once you finish going through all the displays here, you stay left them, but we'd love to have you come out on, on, on Saturday, 11 o'clock, Heron House, to look at the unveiling of these plaques, these historic plaques, and also I still need a couple more volunteers. So I'll be around and I'll be taking names. Have a lovely evening. I'm so pleased to see so many people here and just looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. Who's on first? <laughs> the Chapman yes. family. Okay. Never mind who's on first. I suppose you're alphabet tonight, so Chapman's are first. Okay. Where's my brother Bob? Oh, he died. <laughs> 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 <clears throat> well, how did I say? Testing, testing to. Is it working now? That's I, beautiful. I guess oh, you're it's good. working. You're good. I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it right there. Do I know? Yeah, that's better. Now, who's going to turn the pages of my notes? <laughs> no, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be here. And tonight we're presenting the stories of two families, the Chapman's and Bilos. Um, I have to say there was a very democratic decision made with regard to who would make the first presentation. Uh, Monty Bilo said to me, George, he said, I got a lot of stuff. So maybe you better go first. Uh, tell, tell them how great your family was. It won't take long. <laughs> and Monty thinks he won that one. Uh, a, a wise old curmudgeon told me that, you know, to make a successful presentation, that there's a couple of things that are very important. He said, first of all, you've got to have gray hair to look mature. Secondly, you've got to wear glasses to look wise. And the third and most important is, you have to have hemorrhoids to look concerned. Uh, the, the development of the Chapman family in Charleswood had its beginning with the, birth, with the birth of John Palmer Burke in Sligo, Ireland in uh, 1791. In 1812, he was a part of a work party uh, hired by Lord Selkirk to take a boatload of Scottish settlers heading for the Red River Settlement. He was listed on the records at that time as a useful man. Uh, his journey to York Factory was uh, fairly uneventful in that they almost had a mutiny on the boat and they had a, a, an outbreak of a fever but nobody died. Eventually they arrived in York Factory 
and spent the winter of 1812 and 1813 at York Factory. Uh, in this, the uh, he went to York Factory. The group went to York, from York Factory to the Red River Settlement in uh, 1813. And when Burke reached the Red, Red River Colony, he was employed by the Hudson's Bay Company as a storekeeper. In June, on June the 19th of 1816, some of the settlers in, in and around Fort Garry were frightened by the presence on the outskirts of the settlement by a large band of Indians and Métis. Governor Semple, rather unwisely, decided to go at once to meet the intruders, and a, and a group of 28 men proceeded about a mile from Fort Garry uh, when they realized that the band of Indians and Métis was larger than they first estimated. Governor Semple ordered Burke and another man to uh, return to the fort and bring out horses and a cannon. Governor Semple continued his advance until they reached the spot where the Seven Oaks Monument now stands on Main Street. They found themselves surrounded by the Indians and Métis. The result was that Governor Semple and 20 of his men died. It's now referred to as the Seven Oaks Massacre. Burke, in the meantime, <coughs> with Sheriff McDonnell, were hurrying towards the scene with their cannon when they met some of the Semple party running for their lives towards the fort. Burke managed to extricate himself from this situation, but not before receiving a gunshot wound in his leg from which he suffered for the rest of his life. He lay concealed, wounded, for two days and nights in the bushes without food or water in scorching hot temperatures. He was found by an Indian woman who gave him food and water and dressed his wound. It saved his life. Eventually he was discovered and taken prisoner by the men of the Northwest Company. He was charged with an offense, taken as a prisoner to Montreal, and eventually allowed to go free. He returned as far as Sault Ste. Marie, then walked for 23 days to reach Fort William, only to be rearrested and once more tried and acquitted in 1818. He returned to the colony in, uh, at Fort Garry in 1819. On the 11th of June, 1821, I know you're getting a lot of dates thrown at you here, but um, uh, in 1821, Burke married Nancy Campbell. Nancy's father, Archibald Campbell, was a fur trader from Ireland. Her mother was the daughter of a Sioux Indian chief from St. Mary's Falls, Minnesota. The marriage is recorded as number 24 in the registry book maintained by the Hudson's Bay Company. They raised eight children together in the developing Red River Colony. After participating in the buffalo hunt of 1821-22, Burke became an independent trader until 1832. At that time, the Hudson's Bay Company decided to import sheep to the colony. They employed Burke as second-in-command of a four-man party to travel to Missouri and then on to Kentucky to purchase the sheep. They purchased 1,475 sheep and set out on the 1,500-mile return journey. And you can imagine yourself what it would be like driving a herd of sheep 1,500 miles. After overcoming every difficulty imaginable, on the agonizing trek to Fort Garry, only 251 sheep survived. In 1835, Burke purchased the Hudson's Bay Company experimental farm in St. James. This property reached roughly from Owens Creek, now that's at Pola Park today, uh, on the east end to Ferry Road on the west and from the Assiniboine River north for four miles. John Palmer Burke died in 1851, survived by his wife Nancy and five sons and three daughters. His son Walter Burke was born in 1825 and is the son that we are concerned about. He married Charlotte Cook, a Cree half-breed, and they had a daughter, Catherine Mary Burke, born in 1862. 
Miss Charlotte Cook died shortly after Catherine Mary was born. George Thomas Chapman was born in England in 1861 and came to Canada in 1882 along with his brother Herbert Chapman. And now we're getting to the Chapman involvement. Catherine Mary Burke married George Thomas Chapman in 1889 in the old St. James Anglican Church which still stands on Portage Avenue at Polo Park. Their marriage resulted in them having eight children born between 1890 and 1903. Now, the oldest was Walter Chaplin. And here I'm cueing on our uh, master of the system here. <laughs> you beat me on that one. Walter Chaplin. We're going to show you a picture of Uncle Walt and a little bit about him and his There we are. Right on cue. That's the first picture of my, my Uncle Walt. Uh, many of you will remember his operating a nursery for many years on Roblin Boulevard, which is now part of Assiniboine Park. Uh, driving down Grant Avenue today, past St. Paul's High School, uh, there are many stately spruce trees. These all came from Uncle Walt's nursery, just for your information. Um, the, the, by the way, the boat that just passed by, that was the boat that Uncle Walt served in, served on, in World War I. Uh, Walter Burke had, uh, Walter Chapman rather, had two sons, Walter Jr. and Herb, both now deceased. Walter Jr.'s daughter still lives on Allcrest Street in uh, Walter Jr.'s family home. I have to say that uh, Uncle Walt was a tough old bird. He lived to be 98 years old. At age 88, returning uh, to his home one evening on Corden Avenue from working at his nursery, he stepped off a bus, was hit by a passing van, his left arm, left leg, and some ribs were broken, amongst other injuries, and he made a good recovery. The, the second oldest child of um, George Thomas Chapman and Karen, Catherine Mary Burke was Ada. And Ada married Charlie Parkin from another old-time Charleswood family. Uh, the, they had three children, George, now deceased, who went on to become a lawyer and a judge, Mary, who ri resides on Salt Spring Island, and Iris Morstead, who is was hoping to be here today, but I, I guess she didn't make it. Uh, Iris lives on Velo Drive. There's that name that's going to come up more often. Velo Drive, and uh, the uh, on, on the site of her, her parents' original home. After her mother died at 100 years of age, uh, Iris took over the property and built her new home. And that home happens to be next door to the Velo home uh, on the river. The next child they had was uh, a son, Francis, who died as an infant. Then came Charles Chapman, who spent a large part of his life as a lighthouse keeper on the West Coast, and he never married. Then there was Annie Chapman, who never married and stayed home and, cooked and looked after her parents. George Thomas Chapman, Jr., my father, was the sixth child born to my grandparents. Walter. Charles and my father all served overseas in World War I. My dad joined underage, and I obtained all of my father's military records from Veterans Affairs. Uh, on his enlistment documents, under the question about age, it said, looked 18. <laughs> uh, in the war, my dad was both gassed and wounded, returned to Canada in a hospital ship, and spent a year in Deer Lodge Hospital. He went to university and became a lawyer, graduating in 1923. 
He also married in 1923 and had three sons. My older brother Bob, sitting beside me here, uh, myself and my younger brother Cecil, who's residing in Victoria. My grandparents' seventh child was Bertha Mabel Chapman. We called her Dossie. She never married and worked for a time with the Canadian Indemnity Insurance Company. She, then later she stayed home with her sister Anne. The eighth and youngest child of my grandparents was Alfred Chapman. He lived in a small house adjacent to the stately Chapman family home on the banks of the Assiniboine River, uh, which was on the site of the, which is on the, of the present volleyball courts at the west end of the Assiniboine Park. Uh, Alf went to, to the University of Manitoba and played on the 1923 Memorial Cup winning uh, University of Manitoba hockey team. For many years, he looked after the family market garden operations. He married Florence Good, and we called her Flossie. Flossie was also related to the Burke family. Her mother was Maria Ann, commonly known as Granny Good, and her maiden name was Burke, and was the daughter of Walter Burke's brother, Edwin Burke. Now, Edwin Burke was an elected member of the first Manitoba legislature who lived in a magnificent home right in the center of what later became the Burkeville Golf Course in St. James, close to where my office is located today. Uh, Granny Good uh, became famous for the protection of the legendary Wolseley Elm, and that is a story in itself. Just like Edmund Burke, hiring a train and taking his friends to California for Christmas one year, uh, that was in the late 18, 1800s. Uh, Alf and Flossie raised their five children in Charleswood. Three boys, Clarence, Gordon, and Ray, and two girls, Lois and Joan. And I have to say, by the way, that I'm very happy to see Clarence's widow here this evening, sitting right in the front row. She just celebrated her 90th birthday about two weeks ago. And chap. Uh, Gordon and Joan both live in Calgary, Ray lives in Kelowna, and Lois lives in Comox, B.C. And after the death of Flossie, Alf married Lois Glazier, and she died ten years later. This is where the plot finally thickens. <laughs> Alf Chapman married a third time, and it was to Elizabeth, better known as Bessie Velo. Uh, <laughs> after this long explanation, we finally have a connection of the Chapman and Velo families. And the friendship of these two families was, and still is, a warm and long-standing one. Uh, I mentioned that my father, Uncle Walt, and Uncle Charlie all served overseas in World War I. Of my generation, Walter Chapman Jr., Herb Chapman, George Parkin, and my brother Bob, right here, uh, all served in the Canadian military in World War II. My grandmother, Catherine Mary Burke, traced her ancestry to Sioux and Cree Indians. And I've often wondered if that was perhaps the reason why my father, my cousin George Parkin, my brother Cease and I chose to become lawyers. Maybe you don't get the Sioux bit of it, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, anyways, my grandmother, being the daughter of a Métis person, received what they called script. The property she received about 1890 for her scrip were the river lots where they eventually made their home on the Assiniboine River. Uh, the, this pro property reached south from the river for four miles. And my grandparents built their first home there, which is a log house, and then about 1900 built a large wooden frame house. That's it right there. That's the big wooden frame house and, uh, and in 1912, built their more stately brick homes and on the site of their first log home near the river. The large frame home burned to the ground in 1958. The large brick house stood until it was demolished by the city of Winnipeg when the Chapman property was expropriated for the expansion westward of the Cinnamon Park in 1975. And I'm happy to say that some of the 
interior pa oak paneling and some of the beveled glass windows from that home have been, uh, were saved and incorporated into the restoration of the historic uh, Caron House. Uh, it is interesting that their large stately brick home was built by the same contractor at about the same time as the very stately home at 514 Wellington Crescent, adjacent to St. Mary's Academy. The houses were very similar, although not exactly identical. That, that house on Wellington Crescent is still standing, and you can drive past it at any time and have a good impression of what my grandparents' home was really like. For many years, the home in Wellington Crescent has been, and still is, the residence of retired Senator Douglas Everett. Now, pictures of my grandfather, please. We'll go past the wedding and grandfather. How's that? Good, good stuff. Thank you. Uh, my grandfather, George Thomas Chapman, worked chiefly as a market gardener and won many horticultural awards for his gardens. He was interested in politics and served as chairman of the Rural Municipality of Assiniboia School Board in the 1890s and then on the Municipal Council and was elected its reeve in 1900. Now it's important that you know that Assiniboia at that time consisted of all of that area that we now think of as Tuxedo, Charleswood, St. James, Assiniboia, and Headingley. Now, a vast area for a politician to cover when you think of the means of transportation available to people at that time. He continued as Reeve until 1911, when an act of legislature created the Rural Municipality of Charleswood out of part of the Rural Municipality of Assiniboia, on the south side of the river. Charleswood was my grandfather's place of residence, and he became the new Reeve of Charleswood and continued as Reeve with the exception of a brief period until 1928 when he retired his, uh, from his political career. The rural municipality of Assiniboia presented him with a beautiful black leather armchair upon his retirement. That chair is now in the St. James of Assiniboia Historical Museum. Uh, now there's a picture in the historic, Charleswood Historical Museum of my grandfather's uh, first a council meeting for the RM of uh, Charleswood. And there it is. Sitting in the front center is, is my grandfather and the members of council and some interested citizens. And you know, you can take a look at that picture and uh, the, you can imagine a picture says, is, one picture is worth more than a thousand words. The way they're dressed, you can just see and, and where, where they are and so on. Just look at that and think about what they did, what they went through to get there, and uh, it's a far cry from what we enjoy today. Um, there's, uh, see, uh, then in 1914, this will be the picture for the plaque, please. In 1914, the RM of Charleswood presented my grandfather Chapman with a beautiful silver and oak plaque uh, honoring him as their first read. Uh, that picture is uh, taken, was taken, when my mother on the left, my brother Bob holding the plaque, and myself presented the plaque to the uh, Historical Society. Uh, the original plaque does hangs downstairs in the museum today. Uh, my, and that's another shot of us there, but, uh, my parents were very community-minded. They felt the area needed a church, so they donated the property on Haney Street, where St. Mary's Anglican Church is today. And Ada Chapman and Charlie Parkin were the first couple married in that church. And somewhere we got a picture of them coming down the steps uh, following the, the wedding ceremony. I'll keep my fingers prop crossed here that, that Len can... How's that? Yeah. Uh, uh, the photo on the right uh, that's it. And that's uh, Ada Parkin and Charlie Parkin coming down the steps after their wedding in 1923. That was the very first wedding, I think. The first wedding yeah. in St. Mary's Anglican Church. Um, 
My dad says Bill Eady, who a lot of people know, is the little boy of about two and a half Yeah, years old. Did, did, could you hear that? Uh, Bill Eady, who's a, a famous name in Charleswood, was the little boy on the left at the bottom of the steps there. Uh, my, my grandparents also felt the area needed another school, and I believe they also donated the property where Charleswood School now stands. Oh, where, yeah, sorry, being corrected here, it's where Chapman School now stands. And that's where the original Chapman School uh, was built, and that uh, two Chapman Schools burned down on that site. The existing present building is the third one. Um, they, they disposed of part of their land south of Roblin Boulevard, which is now part of the Assiniboine Forest. Uh, they retained a portion of the property south of Wilkes Avenue for many years, and uh, for some of us of our generation, it was a great place to go rabbit shooting, uh, and uh, of course they were taking hay off the property, and it was just a, a nice place to, to go, and we had a lot of fun there. Uh, when my grandfather, Chapman, came from England in 1882, he was accompanied by his brother, Herb Chapman, a bachelor who lived in a tiny house on Royal Road, which is now called Laxdale Road. He was a carpenter by trade, and besides building numerous houses in both Charleswood and St. James, at one time worked on the construction of the Hoover Dam. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, preparing this uh, information provided a great opportunity for our clan to have a bit of a family reunion to talking about the old days. Cousins Ray Chapman, Gordon Chapman, Lois Hayster, Hayhurst, Joan Hopwood, Hopgood, Iris Morstad, and my brother Bob have all contributed and reminisced about the fun we had growing up. We all agreed we were very fortunate and had a wonderful childhood growing up in this area. We, we recall being told stories when my dad was a boy. Uh, Lord Strathcona had his estate on the north side of the Assiniboine River, what is now the Silver Heights housing development. And as many of you might know, Lord Strathcona was the president of the CPR. Um, and many of you also might know that he had his private rail, railroad built right to his estate and, uh, of course, when we were growing up, we used to uh, go uh, in that area and could see where the rail line had been laid and where the rack tracks had been torn up. But uh, on his estate, he kept a small herd of buffalo. And the buffalo sometimes came across the river to forage in my grandfather's market garden. And it appears they loved vegetables. My, my Uncle Walt and my Uncle Charlie would get on their horses chased the buffalo back across the river to Lord Strathcona's farm. Uh, and, of course, we talked about the steamboats, uh, steamboat paddle wheelers that came up and down the river. I believe they went as far west as Brandon. Uh, that service ended in 1911. Uh, the St. Charles Ferry, from what is now Karen Park, to St. Charles Street across the river. I can remember that crossing myself as I, I took it on, on several occasions. It was operated until about 1959, I guess when they opened the perimeter bridge was the end of it. The Assiniboine River was often very shallow. I remember as a boy watching a religious group baptizing their new members in the Assiniboine River down behind Grandpa's house. Standing in the shallow water, they would dunk their candidates backwards into the river. And we probably would not like to do this today, what with all of the pollution we have. Uh, in the winter, we used to snare fish as they would uh, come to an opening in the river. And really what I'm saying is where the sewers came in, we would stand around the open water. And we could snare the fish and uh, we'd get the, throw them up in the bank and they'd freeze and then we'd throw them into the bear pit at the zoo. And how many of you remember the bear pit at the zoo? Well, some do. Uh, anyways, the zoo's come a long way from those days. And as a, as a boy, I remember the big sign on Roblin Boulevard that proclaimed, Welcome to Charleswood. I, I think somewhere down there we have a picture of that. But uh, this was located on the boulevard of the Chapman property. And during the war, the sign was changed to display the names of the Charleswood residents 
that served in the war. Uh, looking back, it's easy to say that to yourself, what if, when you think of the adventures and misadventures the pioneers went through had turned out differently. I'm sure most of you can reflect uh, on your own family's background this, the same way. My parents, my grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and many of the Burks are buried in the St. James Anglic Anglican Church Cemetery at Polo Park. John Palmer Burke is buried in the St. Boniface Cathedral Cemetery. My grandfather George, Trapman, George Thomas Chapman died in 1940 and grandmother Catherine Mary Chapman died in 1947. There are quite a few descendants of, of them, uh, my grandparents, now living in Charleswood. Our family uh, are very grateful for the tribulations and difficulties our pioneering ancestors endured. They brought us to an unprecedented level of living comfort and we are proud that our ancestors have played a small part in this. And I'd like to thank Lynn Van Roon for his uh, assistance and expertise. That's it. Just, just one comment. No. Uh, we do have the Chapman album with a number of the pictures of the old house and the and your grandparents, and it's down if uh, along with a number of pictures that are relevant to this, it's down and on display. So thank you for the Chapmans for all they've donated and for donating an an album that also tells the story of the Chapman family. Thank you. I'd like to ask a question. You have a question? Yep. Yeah. Where did, where did you find the information about the Burke, the first one who came over with the boat? How is that? Is that in the Hudson Bay archives, or where is that? Um, I uh, there there was several books written uh, on that. Uh, the Hudson Bay archives have a lot of records. I got some information from them. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, the Masonic. Uh, there was a book written uh, about Burke uh, oh, yeah. by um, Bob Emmett, who was a retired bank manager. Uh, not specifically about John uh, Palmer, John Palmer Burke, but it included a lot of information about him. Uh, but I did some checking myself. I went to Sligo, Ireland, uh, naively thinking I could get information. And uh, when I arrived at the they have a, a, a quite a, a good uh, source of information, historical information. And I said, told them what I wanted. They said, well, um, you have to order that information two weeks in advance, and it's 25 pounds, uh, so, uh, or 25 euros, rather. And so I, needless to say, I was stymied. I was hoping to find his, uh, his parents' uh, uh, graves and so on, but... There was, uh, uh, there's been quite a few articles written about uh, some of the early pioneers and John Palmer Burke figures significantly.